Uh, it was while I was writing my book on Nabokov in Iran, and I kept feeling that this is a new reading of Nabokov because of my life in Tehran, and I wanted to explain Tehran through through Lolita and Lolita through Tehran. I felt at that point that my life in Iran and the life of many like me, uh, where uh, Lolita could have been a metaphor for it, um, and Ayatollah comes to Iran and uh, likes to impose his dream uh, upon our reality, turning us into his figments of imagination. And that is what Lolita is basically about, the crime of solipsizing another person's life. He wrote it um, in early 50s, and um, there was a great deal of scandal about it. Uh, uh, he thought that he could never publish it under his own name. Uh, so at first it was published in France, uh, and then there was quite a furor over it in England and US, and finally Graham Greene gave it um, credibility by choosing it as one of the best books he had read that year. He died uh, in Switzerland in 1977. Originally, he was uh, from Russia, and uh, he was born on the last year of 19th century, 19th century, 1899. And he claimed that according to one Russian calendar, his birthday was the same as Shakespeare's. The story of Lolita is about this very sophisticated, articulate European man, 38, uh, who in his childhood falls in love with this girl uh, when he was 13, Annabelle Lee, and she dies, uh, and their love is never consummated. And ever since then, he becomes obsessed with the image of Annabelle Lee. And when he meets Lolita years later, he tries to turn that little girl into his dead Annabelle Lee and he um, seduces and rapes her and keeps her uh, under his yoke uh, for two years until she finally escapes. Uh, she was 12. After the revolution, they lowered the age of marriage from 18 to 9. And I always felt a nine-year-old girl, her life has not st started yet. And when you marry her off uh, to a man, uh, like uh, Lolita, you're confiscating her childhood. And that is, to me, one of the biggest crimes. Actually, I'm rather proud of the fact that many of the laws that the government uh, brought to Iran or imposed upon the society didn't take off partly because Iran was so advanced and people would not, you know, uh, act accordingly. But there are many young girls who are married and there was actually um, a, an official report on many of the young girls who died yearly because of early marriage, you know. Uh, yes, yes, it is true that a man can have four wives. These are all the laws that came back in the name of religion, which I think was abuse of religion as an ideology. What? Yeah, according to some Shia uh, uh, doctrines or uh, uh, tradition, and in Iran uh, this is practiced, a man can marry uh, any number of women uh, he desires uh, from, uh, they have a contract and that contract can be from five minutes to 99 years. Um, but so you can have a wife, you travel to another city, you want a temporary wife. Uh, I think it's legalized prostitution, to tell you the truth. I came to United States um, during the last year of my high school, and I left it after I got my PhD. Uh, I left the um, US in 79, and I stayed in Iran for 18 years before I left in 97. Uh, before that, I was in Iran until I was 13, and then I went to England uh, for my um, high school. I got married at a very young age before I turned 18 to a man who was going to uh, engineering school at the University of Oklahoma. And that's where I went, and that's where I stayed. Everything was in Oklahoma. Uh, the PhD was in English and American uh, uh, literature, and I wrote my dissertation on someone that many Americans don't know about, um, Mike Gold and the proletarian writers of the 1930s. Very few people know that the University of Oklahoma at Norman was very active during the Vietnam and the student protests. But uh, in the last years that I stayed in the U.S., I got involved in the student movement, in the Iranian student movement against the Shah. And that movement was very active all across Europe and United States. Um, I remember myself in front of White House saying CIA agents, U.S. advisors out of Iran. And then they were out. That was in late 70s, in 76, 77.
At the time, um, the way I felt about it, of course, this part of it I still believe in. I felt that um, we did not have enough right to political participation. And certainly the Iranian society was, ad was advanced enough for people to want that. And I was against the political oppression and that existed in Iran at the time. Um, but I feel that I myself and the student movement, uh, we were too ideological ourselves. Uh, so I needed to criticize my own part, uh, you know, in the movement. It is not enough to be against tyranny. You yourself have to choose different methods to confront it. I'm now at Washington, D.C. I mean, I live in Potomac, Maryland, with my family. Uh, but I teach and I have a project at uh, the School for Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins in Washington, D.C. I now have a green card. Mm. I'm still an Iranian citizen. Um, I, I say at the end of the book that I feel that my world, like what Nabokov talks about, has become a portable world. A set of books, a set of principles, and the people I love, uh, you know, so the world has become very small. Being here, I don't feel as if I'm not in contact with my own country, you know, or with my own people. I was married for, uh, f I'm very bad with dates, that's why I'm pausing, for about almost three and a half years. Um, my father at that time was in jail in Iran, and I didn't want him to worry about me and my personal life. So actually, as soon as he came out of jail, I got divorced. Previously, he had been the mayor of Tehran, and he was a rather popular mayor, and he was also very stubborn. And um, so they put him in jail without a trial for four years. And then um, at his trial, he defended himself, and he was exonerated of all the charges except one, which was insubordination. From 1961 to 1963, he ran into a lot of uh, problems with both the Minister of Interior, who was his superior, and the Prime Minister at that time. And of course, without the Shah's consent, that would not have happened. And one of the things that saved him later on during the revolution was that when Ayatollah Khomeini led his um, first rebellion against the Shah in early 60s, against the right of women to vote uh, and a series of reforms that the Shah had brought, uh, my father was mayor and he opened the hospitals uh, to people who were being wounded and he tried to uh, you know, sort of take care of the protesters, and that went into his file. So during the Islamic Revolution, at least, he was spared. I'm married to Bijan. I married him in September of 1977. Two wonderful children. My daughter, Negar, uh, is now 19, and she goes um, to University of Maryland. Uh, she's studying molecular biology. My son, Dara, is last uh, year of uh, high school and he's going to go to Virginia Tech and he wants to follow his father's path which is engineering. I was as long as I remember I loved literature and books this is the only snobism my family ever you know claimed uh, my father all through my childhood told me stories from Iranian cla classical tales. That is how we communicated. If he didn't like one thing I did he put it in a tale and uh, books are my life. I don't remember any time I wasn't interested in reading. Well, actually, I felt that, I mean, there are so many other books and writers that are my favorite, but I divided these books into sort of the times of my life. Um, and I wanted to concentrate on books that explained these periods in my life, you know, sort of carried the rhythm of the life I spent in Iran. And um, Nabokov, as I said, is about confiscation of an individual's life and how individuality is at the center of what we call freedom today. Um, James is about ambiguity and how totalitarian mindsets hate ambiguity. They like black and white. Um, Gatsby is about the American dream and our own dreams of revolution and how it was shattered. And uh, Austin is about choice. A woman at the center of the novel saying no to the authority of her parents, society, and uh, welcoming a life of dire poverty in order to make her own choice. So that is how I divided them. But many other books should have been there. Uh, he left um, 
he ruled for almost 25 years and he left Iran um, in 1978. Um, and uh, uh, that was the time when Shah left and Khomeini came came back to Iran. He, Khomeini left Iran um, in early 1960s after he um, protested against the Shah's white revolution and reforms. Most of his life, his life in exile he spent in Iraq, actually. Um, but uh, the last um, part of it, he, um, Saddam Hussein was making some deals apparently with the Iranian government and life for Khomeini in Iraq was becoming a little hard. So he went to France and um, this little village called Nofle Chateau, which became so famous where everybody would go to visit him. And I think that is what made Khomeini Khomeini. That is what made him so well known with all the media. It was, some people say it was the first revolution in the media, through the media. Uh, you know. Oh, he got amazing attention because, first of all, I think that figure of this stately Ayatollah uh, sitting under the apple tree in Nofle Chateau was a very, very attractive image and Khomeini himself was a very charismatic personality and then many people made sort of pilgrimages. Um, to where he was, you know, whether they were uh, Islam, Muslim or not. And this was a very attractive image uh, for, for the media and the image of the tradition taking over this modernization. I think that aspect of it also was attractive. Well, Iran uh, has almost doubled since the revolution uh, started, so it is near 70 million now. They share the same border? No, no, Iran is Persian. Uh, they, they like to call it Farsi. I, uh, I think like English, you say English, I say Persian. Uh, and Iraq is Arabic. The roots of Persian uh, is Indo-European. And uh, after the Arab invasion of, I think that was maybe the most complete invasion. Our country had been invaded many times, but that was the most complete invasion of the country where the Arabic language so much entered Persian and mixed was mixed with Persian. So you cannot understand Persian grammar without understanding the Arabic grammar. Uh, there are still certain letters which are Persian. Persian has more letters than Arabic ha does. Um, so while I can, when I look at the letters uh, in Arabic, I can understand them, but I can't understand the language. Persian uh, is closer to the Urdu, which is what, the, for example, is being spoken in Afghanistan. Actually, Urdu is a purer uh, form of language than the Iranian uh, version of it, you know, they have. You know, Iran, and, and I don't like to say that it was just the Shah who brought us freedom because it's not true, I mean, or rights of women. Iran, since the, like many other countries in its na uh, neighboring, um, in its vicinity, like Turkey, like Egypt, like Lebanon, um, near the end of 19th century, Iran underwent a great deal of um, uh, social and cultural and political um, uh, turmoil because of the crisis within the country itself. It couldn't hold on to the old despotism. And one of the things that happened was women wanted to become more visible. The first woman who unveiled in Iran was in mid-19th century, a woman named Tahereh, who was also um, the leader of one of the now new religions, Babi religion, which later turned into Baha'i religion, which was an offshoot of Islam, you know. And uh, then uh, with the constitutional revolution, women by and by started fighting for their rights to public education and, you know, other rights. So by the time of the revolution, we had women senators, two women um, ministers, one of them my old high school uh, principal who was murdered by the regime, a woman for min women, minister for women's affairs. We had the right to vote. We had women in all walks of life. Yes, my mother was also one of, she was too outspoken to last, but she was one of the first women along with that high school principal who went to the parliament um, in, in early in 1961. And um, uh, what happened was that the first thing that the Islamic regime did before they had a new constitution was to repeal the family protection law, uh, which which um, protected the rights of women at home and um, at workplace. They 
lowered the age of marriage. Um, they brought back the Sharia laws, which contains stoning uh, for adultery. It is not the law that is in Quran. It is the law that was created afterwards. And if you look at the constitution of I Iran is far opener society than Afghanistan was, for example, or Saudi Arabia is. But the laws are very similar. Um, there are the same punishments uh, for, for the same crimes. And women became the center of attack. The, 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 everything, I mean, the way I look now was all of a sudden a symbol of the West. And unfortunately, some people in the West also uh, call me not Iranian, but Westernized, which I very much resented. Uh, of course, now Iran, because of the, especially the young people's rebellion, is much more open than when I left it in 97. But first of all, I have to cover my hair. I have to wear a scarf. Uh, that would uh, nowadays they're much more relaxed because they couldn't control it. But um, the way these girls are on the cover of my book, that even is not really proper. You know, you should wear cover the hair properly. But nobody does that in Iran today. It so much reminded me of my own students, uh, the sort of simplicity, and uh, it seems as if they're reading a book, you know, and I, the youth, and I wanted the cover to be very simple, and I'm very grateful to Random House. They, they got it from, uh, you know, they bought it from uh, a company uh, which sold these photographs. They're yeah, they're two Iranian girls. They're very similar to my own students. You, you have to, um, you see, the the point is that the contours of your body should not be shown. So you have to wear something like a raincoat uh, or a robe or a, or a chador, which covers your whole body. Yeah. You're not supposed to have makeup on. You see, the philosophy behind it is that women should not attract attention because women become sources of temptation. Uh, which is rather paradoxical uh, because women are so active in Iran and they are there. So one of the things that really bothered me was that I was asked to be visible because I went to work the way I do to here. At the same time, I was asked to be invisible because I couldn't talk, I couldn't shake hand with my male students or my male colleagues. You cannot touch a man who is not related, who is not like your father, your brother or your husband, you know. Uh, you cannot show your hair or other parts of your body to that to that man. Now, from day one, women rebelled against this. Uh, there were demonstrations where hundreds of thousands of Iranian women came into the streets and said no to the veil. They had to make it mandatory at workplace to begin with. Then they made it mandatory in shops. Then they made it mandatory in public as a whole. And since I left Iran, uh, I see pictures of my own students or women walking down the streets of Tehran. A lot has changed uh, because this new generation is not going to take it, you know. Any, like for example, licking ice cream in public is sort of uh, called decadent or unseemly for a woman. Uh, and my um, daughter's school wearing shoelaces that were colored um, were not allowed. Reeboks were not allowed. Um, wearing a certain kind of trendy uh, eyeglasses were not allowed. And I think this is not really religion. I mean, you know, my grandmother always wore the veil uh, till the day she died. And during the Shah's father's reign, for, when for three months, they made the taking off of the veil mandatory. She refused to leave home for three months. So the issue in Iran right now, as in other Muslim societies, is choice. Nobody should choose for me uh, how to worship my God, how to relate to my God, you know. Now the veil, unfortunately, has become a political token, not a token of faith. The war in Iran started in 1979 and went on until uh, 19, uh, 1987. It went for eight years. Tehran, at first, was not as much targeted. Uh, the parts that they f started targeting were the oil-rich parts, which were close to Iran, uh, to Iraq. That was uh, the cities of Abadan and Khoramshar. Um, they really almost demolished those cities. Then they started on the bigger cities, um, Tabriz um, in the northern part, Esfahan and Tehran. And the hardest um, attack on Tehran was those last few months before the war ended. Saddam did. He, um, he bombed an oil refinery 
And that is, I was, I remember we had come from a vacation from Caspian and we turned on the radio and they said that the war has started. But Iran also, at that time, Iran was um, provoking a lot of the Muslims, not just in Iraq, but also in Saudi Arabia and the neighboring countries. Um, every time there was a pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, Iranians were um, starting death to America and calling these regimes puppets of US. So Iran was very politically active at that time. I felt that I was religious, not in terms of, you know, following any specific rules. Um, my parents, my mother went to the pilgrimage. She never wore the veil. My father considered himself religious. Uh, for a while when I was in States, I thought I was a Marxist. Um, but um, like the fact that I thought I was Marxist and I was reading Gatsby all the time, I thought I was a Marxist and at nights I would, I, from since childhood I had a conversation with God, which was very personal, and that's how my father taught me religion should be, a, converse, a series of conversations with God. Yet the women, after the Islamic revolution in Iran, for example, the women would sit behind the curtains or would sit at one other section where they're not seen. Um, but before uh, uh, the uh, Islamic revolution, it was very individual act. Uh, people would sometimes go to mosque for prayer or f especially the Friday's prayers were very important. But it was not a communal action at all. Uh, and at any rate, whether at mosque or at home, women were always sort of segregated. Um, uh, in one sense, Ayatollah Khomeini paradoxically brought traditional women much more into the society because he discovered how amazingly um, helpful they are. Uh, when Shah um, granted the, the right to vote to women in early 60s, Ayatollah Khomeini called that an act of prostitution and he gave a, an edict against it. When he came to Iran and with all these women in the streets that he could in no way put them back, he realized what a gold mine he had. A very, very intelligent man, you know. The names know their lives, yes. Uh, the names I try, some of the names rhyme. Some of the names rhyme. And you know what happened with the seven girls? What happened is that I consulted with one of my girls, whom I call Mana. I said, what name, what name would you want? You know, And then she gave me the name that she wanted and her husband. And then we played with the names. And we tried to find names that would sort of resonate with their personality and with their character. Some of the names are true. My student who was killed um, in chapter three, Razia, I had no reason to not use her name anymore. Uh, she was, uh, of course, I didn't know about that. I found out later. Uh, she belonged to a radical Muslim organization, the Mujahideen, actually, at the beginning. A lot of pe young people at the beginning just were affiliated with these organizations without much knowing what they were. And uh, she was arrested in early 80s and uh, later on executed. Um, I heard about her from another student who was in jail with her. And she told me, you know, in jail, we talked, I told her about Gatsby and she told me about James. So I wondered where my books go, you know, not just in classes, but in prison houses, the government. Uh, in those days, they executed a lot of people and they were very gung-ho about it. It, was, it is now that they don't sort of announce it. I remember that after one demonstration, they had the pictures of the executed um, on the front page of the papers. They felt that this would be a warning to those who, you know, uh, my own cousins were executed. Uh, actually, for being uh, politically active against the regime, for participating in demonstrations. I remember about a 12-year-old girl who was distributing leaflets, and uh, that became well known, and my students were talking about it too, where she was running around while they were trying to catch her, to execute her, asking for her mother. And another thing that happened was um, virgins, supposedly, go to heaven if they're killed. And some of these leftists and radicals who were 
arrested, uh, the guards would um, quote unquote temporarily marry them in order so that they won't be virgins when they go to heaven. Uh, these are the things that will always remain. And these are the things that I feel complicit in too, although I wasn't part of it, you know. I started teaching at the University of Tehran until I was expelled. I, I was, they expelled me in um, 81 or 82. The reason I'm not sure about it is that at some point in 1980, I stopped going and they kept writing me letters and because I didn't want to wear the mandatory veil. And then one day they just said, wrote a, you know, sent me an edict saying that you're expelled. Well, I wouldn't wear it and you couldn't go to work without the veil. Uh, and I know that later I was forced to, veil it, to wear it and a, and a colleague told me, why are you doing this? Because uh, tomorrow you'll be forced to wear it in grocery stores. <laughs> and I said to her that a university is not a grocery store. And if my students up to now have seen me without the veil and they see me with the veil tomorrow for just this money that I'll be getting monthly, I want them to remember at least that there was a protest here, you know. And I didn't teach until uh, mid-1980s. Uh, mid I did go temporarily just for a term or two teaching at the Free Islamic University and the uh, Shahid Beheshti University. And then I chose this one, the one Alame Tabo Tabai University, because I felt it was quote unquote more liberal. Well, of course, you know, what, what the image you have of liberal and the image I have of that time as liberal is different. But that school was an amalgamation of about 23 small colleges and universities that they put together. So they were not so centralized at Alame. And we had more leeway if you had a good head of the department or head of the faculty. There were things you could do that you couldn't do in other places. So when I went there, I remember the first thing they told me, they said, we know about your veil problem, you know, so promises that you will uh, do that. And I said, this is not the law of the land. I have no choice, but I will teach what I want to. And until I stayed there, despite all the problems I had with them, they kept that promise. I thought what I wanted to teach, but they constantly harassed me. The classes became very popular and people would come from all over to the classes, not because I'm so great, but because I was teaching the things that people were hungry for. American and English. Yeah, it was all in English. And you know, they read Tom Jones and um, Wuthering Heights, all of this in English. Um, that is another thing I wanted to tell about in this book. In one sense, we were victims. In another sense, I wanted people to understand how people in the face of such oppression um, create uh, spaces, themselves create spaces um, that nobody can take from them. And they were so eager. I never had such intense classes. By um, mid 19s, again, we went through a pre process of um, deliberalization and the head of our faculty who was very open and he had allowed me to do a lot of programs there. He was, you know, um, taken off his job and they started again talking from the veil to why are you teaching this? Why are these people coming to your class? So I thought that rather than concentrating on my Nabokov and my Austin, I'm concentrating on how far my veil is right now. You know, um, am I too open with my students? It, a teacher cannot teach that way. And my dream was to teach in an um, environment where we were just in love with literature, you know. If they took away a lot of things, I could create my own paradise, you know. And so these girls, of course, there were a lot more, but um, some of them I had no access to anymore. These girls were my most trusted uh, girls. And um, most of them had finished school, but they kept auditing classes and one of them was a freshman who audited my graduate classes and she was wonderful so I thought I would like to find the seven that are most committed and I couldn't have more because you wanted interaction it was after all just in my living room I lived in the northern part of Tehran uh, where you could see the mountains uh, from there and um, there used to be a lot of gardens around it but um, every day I would leave the house and one garden was down and one high rise was going up. My home was not all that big. Um, my parents were not 
as I mentioned, we quote unquote belonged to the upper classes, but we were never very rich. And uh, the house that we had before, which was um, in the same place, my father sold that house. And on the part of the ground, uh, he built a, th a three storied apartment, one for my mother, because my parents separated uh, in. Um, early 80s, one for my mother, one for me, and a sort of a bachelor's pad for my brother. Um, so we had a, a two and a half bedroom apartment, but it was in a very good place of Tehran. I'm not trying to say that. You know. It was the um, uh, fall of 1995. My youngest was um, about 19, almost between almost 20, and the eldest um, were uh, in their early 30s uh, because uh, some of them, like one of them who is now here actually living in California, uh, they had finished their MA degree and they had just come to my classes, uh, you know. So, um, and one of them, uh, she had gone to jail uh, for five years, so she had to restart going to school. Many students in Iran had that trouble, that they had to start late because of the jail. That is the wonderful thing. They had the veil on and then they take it off and they'll be completely different people, even the ones who were practicing Muslim and had and wore the veil. Because, you know, before the revolution, women who wore the veil, they didn't all wore it uniformly. I mean, that wasn't communist. It's in communist China where everybody wears things uniformly. And I think this regime used the veil the way China used the uniform. So under the veil, um, there'll be colors. That was the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed, how hair makes a difference. Uh, one, three of them I hadn't seen without their veils before. And all of a sudden I felt, you know, who is this? Is this the same? Because your gestures change. Um, everything about you changes uh, when you become what you think you are. They weren't supposed to. I remember one slogan on uh, one of the walls in the streets where it said that um, wearing ties means you're an agent of US imperialism. We had a very stubborn and rebellious um, professor at the University of Tehran, and he was really uh, top in his field. He was a linguist. And um, there was a conference at the University of Tehran, and he refused not to wear his tie. And there was a big to do. They couldn't allow Professor uh, and this professor to come with his tie on, you know. And they had to uh, I think cancel his. Uh, he was Professor Botany, and the reason I'm using his name is because um, you know this was open. You know, it's nothing to hide. Uh, they couldn't allow him to come with the tie. And now, of course, uh, men also participated in this process of rebellion. The, my father always wore <laughs> a coat and tie, and they just didn't accept it, you know. I wouldn't think that I'm being uh, politically, uh, you know, uh, rebellious, but they would. And also uh, what, you, what I say, you know, everything that is existential became political. Because in this book I talk about women, I talk about culture and, and human rights. And m my whole existence is right now political. If I walk down the streets of Tehran like this, I'm making a political statement. Uh, and this book is about that. And I wanted people over here to know that this is not a cultural issue. We don't like to be genitally mutilated or be flogged because we don't wear the veil. Our culture is our poets and our great writers, and that um, um, I'm not political, but if I want to live as a woman or a writer or a human being, uh, my existence is in danger. We had a neighboring apartment house where apparently a couple lived, and this guy was who lived there, um, who had antique cars, and actually he smoked opium as well. We could smell it. Um, uh, it was discovered later on that he belonged to this um, assassination teams that the regime had. And within the regime, there were constantly fights between factions. And one day, um, at first, two revolutionary guards showed up at our door, and they said that they want to use our, back, our yard to jump into the neighbor's yard uh, to arrest this person. And we wouldn't let them. And finally, then four of them came, and they said that this guy has now jumped into our yard and is hiding in the yard with a gun. 
and they want to catch him. So for over two hours or so, um, our balconies were used for, uh, you know, uh, uh, this exchange of gunfire until he jumped into the other neighbor's house and they found, finally caught him. And what we were worried about, we had a satellite dish. Of course not, you had a year uh, in jail plus monetary fine. And uh, we later on, our house was raided, and they were nice to us because they took our satellite dish away, but they didn't take us to jail, uh, you know. But um, they were so much worried about that guy, and they used. There was this lady who helped us you know, with our with our children, and they used her as a shield. One of them said that he won't he won't shoot at you, uh, and it showed me uh, how absurd these people are and how vulnerable. I mean, these two factions uh, fighting against one another, you know. This is a m story that always remained with me, and I, I really wanted to have a chance to talk about it. Um, the, sense, the main censor, because there were more than one, but the main censor for film in 1994 was um, almost blind. And before that, my friends told me he was the censor for theater. And after 1994, he became he came the head of a channel, a new television channel. And I always thought, you know, we write fiction as metaphors for reality, but this is one place where reality is its own metaphor. What can I say about this regime that would um, match uh, the blind censor, you know? I felt really lonely during those years, not just because of the political situation, but because there were so few people with whom I could talk. I mean, I could talk literature with my friends and a lot, of, and, and my uh, students who, who were very good at uh, talking about it. But I wanted someone who, who has really read this, I mean, who is my match in terms of the knowledge and, you know. And this magician, um, he wrote uh, criticism, literally, and both film and theater criticism when he was in his early 20s. And he ran a magazine, a literary magazine, which was very uh, both elitist and very prestigious. And um, he also taught at the University of Tehran until the revolution. Um, when the students took over um, his faculty and they wanted to replace um, uh, Racine and Aeschylus uh, and Shakespeare with readings of Marx and Engels, he said that he will never teach again because this is not what he's there for. And so he stayed at home and a lot of literary and film people would come to him and ask him advice. And that is how we became friends. I read, he was the only one who had writ written about Nabokov. He had written about Nabokov's pale fire. And one day I just called him to talk about it to him. And then, you know, until the day I left, uh, we were friends. Our relationship is uh, based on upon absolute trust. And uh, I talked about, uh, Bijan's favorite book is Great Gatsby. He's rereading it again. But, you know, he didn't know about literature as much as, you know, and, and we couldn't talk. And so uh, he knew about the fact that we were very good friends and there was, nobody could replace Bijan for me, you know. One of the things we did, we took long walks because he liked his walk and um, we would take, even during snow, I think he was about eight years older than I was. And um, then sometimes I would go to his home uh, for lunch or for, um, you know, coffee. And he had another friend uh, who sometimes the three of us, and sometimes we all went to a restaurant, um, the three of us. And I had a couple who were uh, bookstore owners, uh, who were family friends as well. And sometimes we went to the mountains with them, you know. this is the paradox of Iran and that is why I'm saying that these guys are using literature as an uh, religion as ideology let me give you an example in buses in Iran buses are segregated women are supposed to sit behind men but in taxis and minibuses women and men are sitting on top of one another I mean there's not enough room so you know so the fact is that you see these contradictions in Iran and a lot of the journalists who go to Iran that is what gets them that the laws are always behind the society itself. Of course, 
they also raid the restaurants. And once when I was there in, with my magician, they raided it. And if they caught us together, despite the fact that my husband knew and didn't um, mind it, they could have, uh, you know, accused us of ad adultery just because we were sitting. When I was in Iran in 97, they still had them. But I'm talking with my friends and uh, students, and they said that um, there is so much unrest that they don't want to add to people's dissatisfaction by having the morality police around. But they still have raid parties and raid houses, and every once in a while, they raid the streets. Every ayatollah, at least in our, in the Shia, they, they give something like their dissertation in order to become one. And there are a set of questions that they, they think that they will be asked and they have to answer. And these are the set of questions that he has and he answers. You see, this is the problem. I don't think that Ayatollah Khomeini really believed in the kind of stuff that he wrote. But this is what he wrote. And this is what they have been writing for 400 years. It's not just him. And um, there was um, an um, Ayatollah in Iran called Gol Payegani, who was also the prosecutor at the beginning of the revolution, and a very ruthless one. And he had a program where he would talk about these issues on television. And one of the biggest jokes about him was when he said that if there is an earthquake, and um, your aunt is sleeping downstairs and you fall on top of her and you have children, then what would happen? And people in Iran made fun of that Hujat um, al-Islam, uh, um, um, and they would call it the Gili show because people would listen to it for laughs, you know. And this is such demeaning of a great religion. And you do have uh, people over here in this country who are absolute fundamentalists and who believe in a lot of, you know, very strange things, but you don't bring it and make it the law of the land, you know. Some of them actually continued uh, the class without me, and they also, one of them, the youngest one, Yossi, she created a class of her own, which was so wonderful that she, when she got her, finally, her um, visa and uh, was accepted at the university here, she was wondering whether she should leave or not because of her class. Um, she wanted to be like her uncles, all of whom lived and came to U.S. and got a degree while her mother and her aunts could never do that. And uh, Yossi was the first woman in her family who is now getting a PhD at Rice. The other one, Azin, whom I talk about, whose husband um, was beating her up and wouldn't let her see her uh, three-year-old girl. She finally got her divorce and she's married again. And she lives in Dublin, California. And she was at one of my talks in San Francisco, which was the strangest thing, seeing her look like that in public. <laughs> Another one, Mitra, is in Canada. Uh, she's going to an art school. And uh, Afnasreen, the one who had to escape the borders, I don't know where she is. And three of them are still in Iran. And uh, my male student teaches and still writes um, criticism, which I hope he'll one day finish. He would come to my house you know, on a one-to-one -one basis. To tell you the truth, for a long time I kept saying it every year. I can't live like this anymore. But this class, which was the highlight of my life in Iran, at least my working life in Iran, also made me realize how isolated I had become. I thought, how long more can I come, can I continue with the class? It can't be forever with these seven girls, you know, now six. and. Um, I can't write what I want because this book, Reading Lolita in Tehran, was in my mind for a long time. And when I would come for talks in the US, um, the title of my talks were a lot of times Reading Lolita. And to tell you the truth, I wanted to write and teach. And um, I didn't have many years left you know, to do that. So um, that was when I decided to leave. I like it very much. Um, uh, I was always worried about, uh, I mean, I'm uh, about teaching here. Um, I wondered if students would like Jane Austen, you know, the way they did there. I didn't want to be disappointed. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. Currently in this class, and today is the last day of that class, I'm teaching Zora Neale Hurston side by side with Jane Austen. The classes I teach here do not have the intensity of my classes in Iran. I mean, People do not sh ruffle their hair <laughs> reading Nabokov. Um, but there is also a freedom and a relaxedness 
about it, uh, which I enjoy. I sometimes think my students do not appreciate um, what they have. I don't know. I would like to leave that option open. Um, I would like to have a portable world. Um, and uh, I, I always dream of going back sometime. Thank you so much.